Welcome back to another episode of a very British space program. You find us on the launch pad here. It is the middle of 1962. In this episode, we're going to be launching some new Hesperus 1 craft into interplanetary space, and we're going to send some more humans into orbit. But if you like it, please like it. If you're enjoying the series, please subscribe and uh, please comment down below. Right, so it is the 16th of July 1962 and we are launching the first of our Hesperus 1 craft. This is Hesperus 1A. It is on the top of a Blue Knight rocket. You've seen those before. We started using them as a, a common thing. So this is departing from Australia because we've got a nice big pad there. Um, we're going to be launching four of these today. Uh, well, in the next few months, shall we say. Um, this is the Hesperus one. It's a new sort of interplanetary uh, bus that we're developing, um, craft that we're developing. You can see there, as it comes up, it's actually two parts. It has a transfer stage and then it has an upper stage. So that transfer stage is uh, more easy to adapt depending upon where we're going to send it to. And the upper stage there, it's got an interesting little design. It's got sort of uneven solar panels. It's got it because it's got multiple uses. It's got space at the back there just if we want to add anything on. Um, the Hesperus is going to basically replace all of our previous sort of interplanetary designs. Um, we'll probably evolve it over time as technology improves, but it's hoped that this sort of two stage sort of craft is actually where we're going to go instead of the bigger sort of beefier one stage craft that we've been doing so far so we're going to be sending four craft out we're going to be sending two to venus and two to mars and the first one this one is hesperus 1a and it's our next generation interplanetary probe probe and it's going to the other orbit of earth and then it's going to be departing for venus okay so it's it's going a little early to be honest with you we're actually sending up a little bit early because um we want to get two of them in and we want to we don't want them hanging around for too long and we know i've got limited launch pad sort of uh, time so here we are it's burning off now and it, it's going off 16th of july 1962 a little bit early but it does mean it's going to take a little bit of extra delta v you can see there on the screen some of the extra delta v it's going to require and it's blasting off there uh, and this is its top stage it's going to use only part of this stage it's going to relight that raw engine when it gets to venus with the hope being this thing can actually go into orbit it's, it's a bit touch and go with this craft, but we think we should be able to make orbit. This one is using um, a little bit different on its Delta V to the, the other ones. It's going to be a little bit more expensive. It's going to use a little bit more extra Delta V to get there. So, 31st of July 1962, and from Spade Adam, we are launching the first in a new manned craft. You will find manned crude, crude craft you will see that there's actually two crew on board. This is, uh, we've sent our most experienced crew. We've sent uh, Matthew West and, and Carol Freeman. However, they've never been into orbit before. So this is the Javelin 3A Dawn. Okay, we're gonna have two of these. It's gonna be Dawn and there's going to be another one which you will see very soon. It's actually called Star. Um, and the idea is that this is basically an evolution of the Javelin uh, 2B. Um, it's got some of the same design philosophy, but we've got a bigger sort of compartment in the top there. We're actually carrying less fuel on the actual orbiter there, and you can see we're just detaching. And this is the orbiter, so it's using a Blue Knight craft to actually launch itself into orbit. But you'll see it's it's much shorter than the previous design. It's, it's stumpier, it's fatter. Its wing surface area is about the same actually, but it comes equipped with two raw engines that means it's got restartability something that our previous craft the the white javelin 2 did not have so this thing is able to actually change its orbital parameters quite easily actually it's got five ray lights in total on those so one thing it does have that beats the uh, the the previous craft the white javelin 2 is that we can actually eva from this one so there we are the first EVA carried out by Carol Freeman. She will, uh, she, she's, she's loving it, it's a bit scary, I'm guessing. She seems to be hovering above the cockpit. Matthew's actually gonna sit inside there. Uh, in reality, Matthew is actually going to uh, go on a bit of a spacewalk after this, but I don't need to show you both of those. Um, they reach or orbit quite in, you know, quite easily. Um, they carry out their research. They're actually doing research into visual acuity and simple organism, uh, egg growth and things like that. Um, she is 
wonderfully the first person in, in, in to to walk sort of free of, of of the shackles of craft which is uh, you know we, we get a good video of it anyway very, very good propaganda shall we say I need to do that um, and then after 24 hours uh, the craft is uh, basically done some science and it, it's needing to come home it's its energy reserves its power supply is limited at the moment it does have space on the back there and what you don't see is the little rear end there within the bay on e between both of the engine uh, engine mounts there you see there the engines are mounted to either side within there is space for sort of payload additional batteries and food and so forth and potentially docking hardware should we choose to use it Ooh. You see there, we forgot to detach that before going through the atmosphere. So what we actually had explored there was some of the, the life support system, the extra life support materials that were additional payload. So they're going to come through and they're going to use this very similar sort of um, approach to the, the, the Javelin 2B. This is something we've developed. It's the whole slip glide approach. And you can see they're holding it quite now. It, around the 75 kilometer range, they're using some of that lift from from the interaction with the atmosphere just to lift them up and then they're going to get a bit of overheating. Now the interesting thing we found was that even though they're coming in flat, one of the wings preferentially is the overheating, um, which is a bit of an odd one actually. It's something to do with uh, heat transfer or the way we've designed the craft, we're not entirely sure, but one of our, our wings starts to overheat. So anyway, what we actually did was we tilted the craft a little bit, um, partly because we want to try and see if we can actually change our uh, our direction of flight and try and control and get a bit more accurate accuracy in our landing area and stuff like that but also because it actually takes that that hot wing out of the um out of the, the the major sort of hot plasma stream that we're getting and there we go we see we tilted as we dropped through the atmosphere of more we started tilting around now, i'm not going to show you all of the stuff that they're doing and this is sped up considerably i think this is about four times the normal speed but once we get down low enough, we can start to get a bit more maneuverability and we start to sort of swing the craft around and yeah, we're just gonna, we're gonna jump it down. It uses the same landing approach that um, the previous crafts uses, the parachutes. We haven't got to um, wheeled landing yet and we don't need to, to be honest with you. So we're actually gonna land in mainland Europe, nice and safe and sound, which is wonderful um, for us. So this craft first flight of the uh, White Javelin 3A um, is a success and hopefully its sister craft the the star is actually un underway of production right now and then this one can be refitted and reflown hopefully so it should save us a lot of money so 9th of august 1962 we're really moving through we've got june we've had july we're now in august is 9th of august 1962 and we're launching another of our hesperus one craft this is the sister craft of hesperus 1a this is hesperus 1b and this is going to go to venus again so we've cleared the orbit out our previous crafts already heading off to venus so we've, you know there's a good two, almost two months between these craft there's a big difference in in time there um just because actually venus compared to some of the planets that we might want to go to venus is actually a lot easier to get to but even so not going at the optimum departure time isn't going to be great so this is actually launching up a couple of days before our optimal departure window and we're just going to leave up on orbit for a couple of days make sure everything's working because you know we're, we're looking back at our previous flights and um yeah there were some some dodgy ones weren't they um so we need to be a bit careful about that so it goes up into orbit and you can see there we're using that transfer stage again to uh, to just orientate it nicely we want to get it into an orientation where it can sit and get the uh, the sunlight onto its solar panels these two craft together have enough solar power to basically survive indefinitely for you know in orbit of earth and particularly in orbit of venus they'll be fine as well so after a couple of days um it's about the 11th of august now we're actually sending this thing off to venus and it's very much the same view the same departure that you've seen before with these special amazing clouds that don't seem to move which is a bit odd but we won't, we won't look at that it's obviously a freaky thing that's going on there um so that's going uh swimmingly and we're, we're actually looking forward to hopefully getting into orbit of venus and getting some good science because we got a lot of science through last time but you know what we, we, we think there's more there and there we go the, the row engine just finishing off the burn and then we're just going to use some RCS, not RCS systems, RCS or RC systems to uh, to bring it into a nice orbital path around around Venus, or more accurately, a flyby. We're gonna we want to try and put our periaps quite low. We want to get it as close to that atmosphere as possible. So we're gonna spend some time, and we'd ideally like a sort of semi-polar orbit, but we're not too fussy. Equatorial polar, we don't mind. So next mission, 
we are going to send a couple more crew up and they are going to do a bit of a bigger mission this time. So they're going to actually be trying to do two different sets of orbital parameters and the new craft is able to do that. That's why it was designed like this. Two people, two different orbits, we can achieve this. So let's launch it. So this is the star. This is the sister craft of the Dawn. Um, same design, exact same design. We have tweaked some of the uh, the life life support systems in the back there, just just basically getting a bit more in there because we know there was a, enough fuel there. So this is the fourth of September, nineteen sixty-two. Um, while we were rolling this out, we actually heard that the uh, the USSR had placed two Vostok craft into orbit at the same time, meaning that they have placed two crew in orbit. They did it using two separate craft. Um, now, we don't know whether to take this as a positive or negative because being able, only being able to fit one crew member in a craft is, is a limit, but being able to launch two craft so close together is actually quite staggering. Uh, we currently are very limited on that. We could not launch two of these craft so close together. So maybe we need to change our approach and design. And here you can actually see on the back of our craft, you can see the little gray compartment at the back there, which currently holds the extra life support and electricity systems. but we can actually expand that and it can actually hold other things. So um, we're gonna perform some on-orbit maneuvers. We're gonna change our orbit prior to return. Um, the, I, must, I forgot to say, the, the crew for this are actually uh, Jane Marsh and Anita May. So they're, they're both two rookie pilots. Oh, well, so, and Jane Marsh isn't, but Anita May is a rookie pilot. Jane Marsh is, of course, our pilot extraordinaire, um, second, second person in orbit. Um, so they're just going to play around at the moment with the actual craft there. They're checking out how to orientate it, how stable it is in orbit, checking out the, RC the RCS and how it rolls and things like that. The, um, the initial orbit they had was perhaps a 600 kilometers for one day. And they then, after one day, brought that down uh, using the onboard engines just to drop it to a, to a perhaps of just over 300 kilometers uh, where it stayed there for another day. And now we're actually um, we're coming in to home so we've we've done all of our our work in orbit you can actually see well you may not be able to just ahead there there is actually a little something glinting in the horizon that's actually the additional payload that we've detached and um so we're just coming through the atmosphere and you can see we're getting a lot of reheating we've come in actually quite fast on this one quite hard it was quite a hard hard approach and you can see there's a lot of fighting to try and actually keep keep it in an orientation when we're slowing down and not messing up our wings and overheating because it is problematic, shall we say, the least. Um, we did have a lot of difficulty actually with this one, even though it's a it's a, a direct replica of Dawn. Star does seem to fly just a smidgen different. She seems to overheat more. Don't know if it's the pilot's skill or not. We're not entirely sure. Um, however, we uh, we do make it through. There's no major incidents. We are a little concerned. It is it has highlighted potential problems with the craft and um you know we i think we need to keep be aware of that in the future and, and what that will mean to all of what we're doing yeah so we're just going to come down like so all the way through the atmosphere it's wonderful it's wonderful it's wonderful so we're just continuing on through where we notice that the uh, the actual crew compartment gets a little bit hot but that sort of settles itself down not a big problem we can deal with that um, and we're just bringing it through now in a, a little glide stop there. Um, we're going to bring it down actually in the in the sea between or near Portugal and the UK. Um, of course, the Portuguese long-term allies of us now. And this has become a bit standard for us. So we're going to drip it into the water and off we go. So it is the 11th of September 1962. And this is the launch of our third Hesperus 1 craft. This is destined for Mars. So this is the first of a pair that are going to go to Mars and it's it's very much the same craft. Um, the big difference with this mission profile is that it's actually going to sit for quite a while in orbit. So this craft isn't actually going to depart from Mars until October. Mars is a little bit more of a push for us. It takes a little bit more energy to get there. So we're actually going to be sitting this in orbit until a more opportune time to the right transfer deadline, but uh, transfer stage. But the big issue we have is that actually we don't have enough launch pub capability to put both of our craft up in the window. So this one's going to go up early. It's got solar panels that will survive that time. It'll it'll look after itself. We don't have a big issue with electric. Well, we do. It's, it's tight on electric when it gets to Mars, but it should be okay until it gets there. So 
it goes up into orbit. Nice and easy, you can see it's pretty much the same craft. You know, we've got the same sort of uh, Delta V availability. Um, and then on the 20th of September, we're launching the second one. So this is the Hesperus 1D. Um, and this one is gonna join its sister craft in orbit, waiting to go up to Mars. Um, <clears throat> we did send both of these up early uh, because they were built early and we wanted to get number one the launch pad available for other things and number two we wanted to make sure that we actually didn't have a mess up because we do we did have the potential for a third craft if it went horribly wrong because we are well we, we thought we could rush something if we if we really needed to because we, we would have um some time and we've got a number of things shall we say partly constructed so it was whether we could strap something together just to, to make up in case both of these went horribly wrong. But um, they didn't actually. They got into orbit really well. These, these craft have actually done really well. Transfer stages looking wonderful at the moment. Um, so far, so good with the Hesperus series. We don't seem to have any problems at all. So, 7th of August 1962, just prior to departure of the Hesperus probes from Mars, we actually managed to make connection with EOS 2. So this this is the one of the probes that... 2A, which flew past um, Mars, ooh, I think probably a while ago, uh, and it's now close enough to establish communications with Earth again. So this is, I think, two, two episodes ago, so about a year ago in game time. It flew past Mars. We didn't have connection at the time. It now, however, has actually, um, it's, it's on an, uh, an orbit, which has actually brought it closer to us. So we're now getting a signal, but also we've improved our own communication system, which I think has helped significantly on that one. So we're actually getting some of its data back now. So it does give a bounty of science, but it doesn't complete our mission regarding science from Mars, because although it's transmitted Mars science, it's transmitted it from interplanetary space, which seems to not help. Anyway, 21st of October, 1962, we are setting off the first of our Hesperus craft. That's 1D. It's gonna go first, the last of the ones to launch is going first. And then here we are, just departing with Hesperus 1C. These are both hopefully gonna make their ways to Mars and have a bit of a longer visit than the EOS craft. They are designed to stay for longer. They're designed to do more science. And as it departs, I'm gonna say, until next time, have a great one.